Now, so big, big, big topic came up. Now, I already booked you to come on the show because there's so much that's been happening in the Red Sea. But last night, uh, we'll get today, uh, Yemen time, there was a bunch of U.S. strikes against the Hothi. I believe 70 plus strikes, maybe five deaths, something like that. Sal, what is going on with shipping? Dooner, the last time I was on, I was wearing a camel head. And it was the Christmas. And today's show is going to be crazier than that because of yeah. what is happening right now. We're trying to keep track of it. What you saw last night was a series of strikes by the United States and the United Kingdom. It, it's twofold reason. Number one, the UN Security Council came out and gave basically they, they, they spanked Yemen for the for the 10th time. And that gives them a little bit of coverage. But the biggest thing was on January 9th, the U.S. and the U.K. ran a series of convoys through, including four U.S. ships, and it was the most concentrated attack yet against commercial shipping. This has been going on since November 19th when the Houthi grabbed the Galaxy Leader in that dramatic helicopter attack. Since then, they have been attacking ships ostensibly connected to Israel, but that's not true. They've been hitting any ship they really want to. And I guess after the 27th attack, that was enough. The U.S. and the U.K. have struck. The problem is I'm not exactly sure this is going to open up the Red Sea. We may actually wind up seeing more diversions, including tankers now, start avoiding this area. And it could have a actually a negative impact on the commercial side. You know, it's, it, leading up to this, there was a lot of debate online about what the U.S. presence, U.S. force, U.S. retaliation. What do we do? I mean, one of the best ways to get a, like attacked in the world is to attack tankers or trade. That is global money. Uh, nobody is happy about ships getting attacked. But now that Biden has done that attack, there's been a lot of critics there. John Conrad wrote, they fired on a U.S. merchant ship. I'm not happy with this outcome, but it's not illegal to strike back when ballistic missiles are fired on unarmed ships. This is a rules of engagement debate, not a war debate. If Biden lands troops, that's a different story. Is Are we doing the right response right now? Where does this put us? Well, we've been doing a very defensive stance. We've been very proactive, not very reactive. And one of the things that the U.S. has done, along with its allies, was try to build this kind of naval wall between Yemen and commercial shipping. And the problem is, if you're sitting there as a gatekeeper and you're trying to skeet shoot drones and missiles coming overhead, you know, the Navy is great at this. They're really good at it, but they don't have a 100% success rate. And sooner or later, we're going to see ships hit. And unfortunately, what the people who are driving, whether or not the ships go through the Red Sea, not so much the Houthi, it's the insurance companies. Container ships diverted around because a container ship's cargo is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you start escalating war risk insurance, it gets really expensive. Tankers are a little bit lower. They're maybe in tens of millions of dollars. But right now, the question becomes, will the strikes make it safer for ships to go through? It's not a military judgment. It's an insurance and commercial judgment. We're already seeing this massive diversion. 30% of the ships that normally go through the Bab el-Mandab, this is that strait between Djibouti and Yemen, 19,000 ships a day, or 19,000 ships a year, excuse me, are now going a different route. That's an extra million dollars at least in transit costs for those ships to go down. And you're seeing it in the escalation of the freight rates right now, not to mention Egypt is losing a half a million dollars for every ship not going through. 20 ships a day not going through, that's $10 million. They, they're standing to lose 2 to $3 billion a year right now. You know, and that's that's a huge issue. And there's a lot of when you're talking about global trade, you're talking about a lot of players. It's not just the U.S. or England or the Netherlands or or these places. You're also talking China. You're talking India. You're talking Germany. You're talking a lot of really big, heavy hitters who can retaliate against you. Analyst Greg Bruce says the Hothis are a little reckless as far as taking risks, but I think they know well enough not to go after Chinese ships because this would complicate Iran's relationship with China. The Hothis probably want a relationship with China. Do you agree? Because there's VSAs, I mean, if you attack like a Maersk vessel, there couldn't be freight on there that's originated from China or people who are partnered with China or ordered stuff via China. Well, China is exerting a, a lot of power behind the scenes. And this is the thing we're not exactly see seeing. I should note that there have been some Chinese ships hit, the, o uh, the number nine, which is an OOCL ship, uh, Maersk Gibraltar, which is actually owned by a Chinese company, flagged in Hong Kong was hit. But what we're seeing right now is a lot of companies are having their ships on their AIS. This is their automated information uh, identification system. Say, you know, we're Chinese owned or we have Chinese crew on board or, you know, they're, they're flying the Hong Kong or Chinese flag. 
And, you know, th this is an interesting geopolitical issue. We, we don't know what role the Chinese are playing behind the scenes with the Houthi. And if all of a sudden it appears it's safer to be under the, the protection of China just by sitting there and putting it on your AIS transponder when the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy are actually shooting missiles, you know, that's an interesting change in the geopolitics. Because remember, we're seeing a lot of other instability in that region, too. We've had Somali pirate attacks where one ship has been grabbed. Uh, two other ships were attempted to be grabbed. Uh, we have Iran that attacked two different ships on, on separate occasions. And then a seizure just the other day of a ship coming out of Kuwait, which is arguably a different issue. But we're definitely seeing the instability in the region, which means for all of us, once you start seeing risk added to the transportation of freight, you know as well as I do, whether it's trucking, rail, air, or, or sea, it gets expensive for the shipper, and it's going to get expensive for the consumer. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned uh, insurance, too. That's a, it's not just freight rates that have gone up. It's insurance rates moving goods through there. We have a statement here from the president of Yemen. He says, we say to our brothers in Palestine and our people in Gaza that our blood is not more precious than your blood. And we are clear of conscience that we are actually participating with you and that Palestine is not being bombed alone. We affirm that Palestine after today will not be in the battle alone. How long is this conflict going to go on for? I mean, the, the, the Yemen Houthi, they fought conflicts for very long periods of time before. Well, that, that's the issue you're looking at here, because the, the reason for the Houthi to do this has to go back to Israel and Hamas and Gaza. And I did a podcast yesterday where I joked, you know, the way you solve this is Mideast peace, and that's not happening anytime soon. And so what kind of leverage do you have against the Houthi? There was a story the other day that the container liners and shipping liners were, were going to bribe the Houthi. They were going to pay them off. I don't think you could bribe it and pay off the Houthi. They, they, are, they are political. They're religious. They are ex exercising their, their control. But who you can pay off and who you can kind of get rid of uh, to fix this problem is Iran and China and Russia, those who have power over the Houthi. And I think we need to be looking at this because right now, as long as Israel is in Gaza and you have that incident happening down there, and again, it's horrific. It's horrific of what the Hamas did to Israel. It's horrific, the bombing that's going on in Gaza right now. And I'm not taking sides by any means. But the Houthis see this as their ability to reach out and impact the world. And I got to say, for a non-state player, again, Houthi are not the government. They're a faction in a three-way civil war in Yemen. They're using fairly rudimentary weapons along with some sophisticated ones, and they've been able to impact 12% of the world trade and actually make the major container liners of the world divert their ships. And they're going to cost billions, billions of dollars in the economy of the globe because they're supporting this. It really demonstrates how much a small player can actually influence global trade right now if you're astride a, a key maritime choke point. Yeah, and look, this is from before the strikes. Rachel published an article about us taking calm seas for granted in her most recent modes. And one of the art one of the quotes in there is rates from Asia to North America have popped by 75% over the last month, according to Flexport. And the firm expect rates to increase by an additional 50 to 100 percent in the second half of January. Meanwhile, in Asian Europe, rates are up over 200 percent. Are we getting back to twenty thousand dollars? You, if you looked at what Drury just put out, they said rates going from Asia into the Mediterranean are up 400%. Remember, we've got not one issue going on, but multiple issues. You've got the Panama Canal, which you were just talking about with Maersk going through. We got low water in the Panama Canal, which means two thirds of the ships are just getting through the Panama Canal. But you've got to offload part of the Neo Panamax ship. This is why Maersk is putting those containers on the rail so that they can offload part of the ship, get through the canal and get to the other side and pack those containers back on board. But remember, just before this all started, the Alliance and the Ocean Alliance, two of the three big uh, alliances in global shipping, announced we're not going to go through the Panama Canal. We're going to go through the Suez Canal. So 30% of those containers that are going to Europe gets transloaded and shipped over to the United States. It's why you're seeing the rates between Asia and New York pop across the Atlantic. It's why you're seeing the rates begin to climb going between Asia and the East and Gulf Coast via the Panama Canal. It's also why you're going to start seeing a wave of ships probably start heading back to L.A. and Long Beach. And I hope they fixed everything because if a wave comes in, we may see the same thing. I don't think we're going to get to the $20,000, $25,000 spot rate we saw. But this last week, we saw the fastest growth in freight rate ever recorded in a single week.
Well, sales shippers have to be because like one big component of the supply chain crisis during the pandemic, it, you know, rates were a big thing, but so was time, time to getting inventory in. And I know a lot of that had to do with congestion at the ports and everything, but we're talking about time already being extended. It's taking much longer to ship uh, goods than it used to. And now um, it's like, you know, 15 days. But as this extends, that timeline is going to go out longer and longer. Is this going to panic shippers into buying more and more goods to make sure that they have inventory in place? So you're seeing the disruptions hitting Europe first. So yeah. because of the diversions around, it's going to start hitting the European ports. And you're going to see the backlog because the schedules that have been in place assumed a Suez Canal transit. So now you're going to get those backlogs. And you're going to have to put more ships. Now, containers are lucky for two reasons. Number one, Q1, it's before the Chinese New Year. It's post uh, the uh, Christmas holiday. So this tends to be the down period. So there is capacity out there. Plus, number two, the container liners have invested and bought in container ships like crazy. So all that, that, that the ships that they were bought when they were drunk with the COVID cash is now being floated out and put on service. So there's excess capacity to absorb this. The problem you're going to get is obviously that this is going to hit in waves. It's going to hit Europe first. It's going to hit the back end of Asia next because the return of empty containers is going to be displaced because you're not going through the Suez. You've got to go around Africa and the arrival of goods coming to the United States. And shippers are going to start to want to, first of all, they're seeing those rates go up. And if they don't have those long term rates locked in, they're going to start jumping at these spot rates where they're at. And you're going to see people start doubling up. Where we saw the problem during COVID, remember, was that people started shipping more on the capacity that was out there. You had the COVID economy, and then you had the kind of return from COVID, which we never knew when it was going to happen. So they, they wound up shipping additional goods. And if that starts happening, then you could see a repeat of what we saw in COVID if all of a sudden we start overloading the container system. And because what happens is that that rolls out into the ports. And, you know, you had on uh, the, the discussion the other day about the trucks in and out of L.A. and Long Beach. Are we better able to do drayage out of L.A. and Long Beach than we were two, three years ago? And I think the answer is no. No, we're, we maybe even I mean, they're not really enforcing that. It's, it's, it's on the books. People are supposed to be compliant. But I mean, as the Harbor Trucking Association said, they can enforce that. They can gate you out. And if that happens, that could cause a really big crisis at the port. It, it all feels very ominous. But you tweeted that not everybody is listening to this. Your tweet says ships warned to avoid Red Sea after airstrikes. OK, that's not happening. Well, traffic is down 30 percent. And you can see that container ships over 4000 TUs are largely bypassing the Red Sea. There's still a lot of traffic going through. What's happening here, Sal? Right. So you're still seeing about 70 percent of that traffic going through. Now, remember, what you're seeing there is a range of ships. We're seeing a, a batch of smaller container ships going in, which were, tend to be regional. They're not really being targeted. We're seeing some bulk carriers going through, but we're also seeing a lot of fuel ships going through. For example, a lot of Russian tankers going through. These are ships carrying Russian oil. Uh, the big concern now has to be if you're in Europe heading into wintertime is what happens if all of a sudden oil starts getting displaced in energy. Remember, because of Russia-Ukraine, again, we're bringing another uh, uh, black swan event in here. Because of Russia-Ukraine, there's no longer the import of liquefied natural gas and oil and diesel from Russia into Europe. So what the Russians have done is adapted the black fleet, uh, the dark fleet. They're sending oil through the Suez Canal. It's heading to the Middle East, to India, to China, to be refined and shipped back. Well, we just saw that Scorpio tankers announced that their clean product tankers, their diesel tankers, are going to start taking those long routes around Africa. And the horror, the, 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 the disaster of all times would be if you hit a liquefied natural gas carrier or liquefied petroleum gas carrier, if they can't come from Qatar in the Persian Gulf or from Western Australia through the Suez Canal, they got to route around Africa. Remember, the whole reason we got super tankers, the big, massive two to three million barrel tankers, is because the Suez Canal closed for eight years from 1967 to 1975. Well, you're seeing a partial closure right now. But what we may see is more ships. And, and while ships are going through, we're still getting that 70% traffic through. If it starts going down further, this is going to impact different sectors. And remember, we don't have an excess amount of tankers like we do in containers. There's a very finite amount of tankers out there. And if you get to stretch them over a longer distance, we may see shortages and the cost to transport oil and liquefied, liquefied natural gas, petroleum gas, and uh, refined products is going to go up.
Sal, there's, there's, there's war all over the place. There's conflict going on all over the place in 2024. Will this evolve into like, oh, there's a number of nations like going after the Houthi with these airstrikes. Is this going to evolve into a world war? Or does it stay contained as a, as a proxy battle that's just over the region? Well, I, I think you're looking at proxy battles right now. And I think one of the reasons that you saw, for example, the U.S. and the U.K. stage these strikes is a lot of nations don't want to get attached to the Israeli-Gaza conflict. And, you know, we we, saw, we had a press conference with the commander, the admiral from the U.S. Fifth Fleet, the combined maritime force, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper. And Admiral Cooper made clear distinction between the ships that were doing the escort mission and those doing the strike. The big thing I'm watching to see right now is do some of the nations who announced that they were going to contribute naval forces to protection in the Red Sea back out now because of the strikes. Uh, you need those naval forces down there to provide an air of protection to provide ships. If not, this falls on the United States and the British to do. And they just don't have the depth of assets to be covering all the hot spots in the world right now. And I, I think that's the danger you see is we're seeing so many black swan events that all the, you know, it's hard to cover them all. And if you're shipping, if you're, if you're hauling cargo right now and you're moving freight right now and you're going to your risk analysis people and you're trying to figure out what's the next thing coming, who knows? Because I, nobody had Houthi on their bingo card interdicting 11% of the world trade. Everybody knew the Houthi were there. They knew what they were capable of, but they've been fairly minor attacks. The fact that they amped it up to this level is, is a whole new level. And again, if the Houthi can do that in the Bab el-Mandab, then other groups can do it in other maritime choke points around the world. Now, are, are they are the Houthi checking marine traffic? Because Captain Singh tweeted, Singapore container ship Kota Hakim crosses the Red Sea with the Vestal destination as VSL no link Israel. Oh, yeah. I, I think they're, they are getting – there's a lot of intelligence being done. The Houthi are, are using AIS. I know that because when they when they attacked the OOCL uh, – I mean the uh, number nine, which is an OOCL ship, initially it was actually listed as another operator, one that they had a problem with. So they are using AIS, and what we're seeing is a mixed bag of how AIS is used. For example, in the January 9th battle, there were four U.S. flagged ships in the Red Sea – one of those four vessels had been sitting there with its AIS on for over a week. And the minute it turned off its AIS, it was pretty clear where it went. You know, it was going to come southward. Uh, you also had an Iranian vessel, a vessel that had been there for years, actually, that got underway and then patrolled right off the area where the strikes happened. That tells me that that ship either really wanted to watch a, a, a show of missiles or it was per perhaps providing intelligence. So yeah, the, the Houthi are gathering intelligence. They're probably getting it not just from open source information, but also probably from the Iranians who have a major shipping line. You know, Entech is a, is a big, huge shipping line for Iran. They, they ship oil all over the world. So they have the depth of knowledge to provide this intel. So again, we're in an information age here where the Houthi are using intelligence on their side. I asked our friend John Conrad this question, and I'm going to ask you because I wanted your opinion. You guys don't always agree. Sometimes you have some heated battles. Will this usher in a new era of piracy? I, I think you got to be careful about the, the phrase piracy because we use piracy in kind of in two ways. One is, you know, it's the private privateer. It's the, it's the person who's out, the criminal, basically, who's out robbing for his own personal need. But what you're seeing more is privateer. John and I went to SUNY Maritime. We're the home of the privateers. Privateers are state-sponsored pirates. And, I, you know, in many ways, the Houthi are not a national government. They're, they're kind of a, you know, it's a three-way civil war going on. And so they're operating more like a privateer in some ways because they say that they're a state and that's how they're operating. The Somali piracy going on right now, the capture of the ship, the Ruan, for example, that isn't the Somali piracy we saw of the 2000s and the 2010s. This is a different style of piracy because we know this because the ships are not being uh, held for hostage. There's been no ransom. So that tells me that they're using this different technology. And also piracy was something that could be handled, this small boat piracy. It's where you saw the armed guards going on board. It's where you saw the use of razor wire and the, fi and the fire hoses you have there. No private detachment, armed security detachment, can stop a ballistic cruise missile coming at you. Matter of fact, some of the navies can't stop it. So we're definitely seeing this escalate from piracy to, to state-sponsored privateering, I think. 
Sal, this is this has been too heavy. It's a Friday. We need a little levity. <laughs> I got to ask you, F3 is coming up in November. Do you think we can get myself, you, John, uh, Conrad, and um, Ross Kennedy in some of these little boats? Can we do a little regatta on the Tennessee River over here? You got, you got the, yeah. I, listen, listen, I missed the last F3, unfortunately, due to a family thing, so I'd love to be out there. I think us in the Tennessee doing this would be fantastic. And let me be clear, John Conrad doesn't know what he's talking about. He drove, he drove big oil rigs. I drove big ships. He doesn't know what he's doing. We got to get Rachel out there too, because my goal in life is to convince Rachel Premack that big boats, you got to love big boats. Now, are, are these real? Do they really train, do they really train boat pilots on these little boats? Yeah, up, up at uh, Mass Maritime and actually at a school up in uh, Switzerland, up in a lake. Uh, the ships act, uh, those ships are weighted and, and configured so that you can actually do. This is before you had simulators and, and all the high tech stuff. This is the way you would do it. And it actually is a great simulator because you have to learn how to maneuver ships at very low speeds with very little power on. And in particular, how ships react in very narrow waterways, like you see there with the two ships passing. Ships will react in a very uh, way. And so you would have the uh, pilots sitting there in the ship and an instructor behind them. And the ships would be weighted like normal container ships. Wind would affect them. Current would affect them. It's a, actually a really good way. It's, it's very much like a uh, practice driving that the police do and, and you know, in those closed, uh, closed uh, uh, areas that they practice on. Well, Sal, so it's fair to me. What if we also roll in as part of this? It'll be like a, a dicathlon or a bicathlon or something, some little tiny trucks. How do you think you do here? Oh man, we we can we can we can bring the trucks in. We can bring the little planes in so that Craig feels at home. I'm, I'm all for this. We can we can turn F3 into. We can get all the different modes of transportation. We can get road. We can get rail. We can get air, and we can get sea. And of course, everyone will love to see the best. Al, so we are out of time. You have an amazing YouTube channel. You've probably got your uh, your your gold play button, or at least your platinum one by now. How do people go find it? But it's a silver one. I did get it, and I appreciate that. Head on over to YouTube, What's Going On With Shipping. Follow me over on Twitter, where I follow Dooner at uh, Macagliano S. And at all times, you can always find me here working at Campbell University. Go, go Hums. Thank you so much. We'll keep you uh, afloat of what's going on with shipping. There's no show on Monday. We will be back Friday. Sal, you have a great week, and you can find me at Timothy Dooner on Twitter, S-D-O-O-N-E-R. You can find the show at FW What The Truck. Take care. Don't be a stranger. Good luck, NASA.